Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV Live. For all of you joining us for the first time, welcome. And go ahead and introduce yourself down in the comments and let us know where are you from? Like Body MM here from Atlanta. Um, I'm coming to you from Cincinnati, Ohio, and the snow just finally melted off of the ground, though the parking lots still have the giant piles of it. Looking forward for it to it warming up here. Now, for those of you that are new, let me introduce myself. My name is James. I have kidney disease. I was diagnosed with stage five a little over two years ago. I've been very, very focused on getting myself healthy getting my weight better under control, managing my blood pressure, stop doing things that are bad for my kidneys, like using ibuprofen and things like that. And I've improved my overall health during those two years and my kidney labs look so much better. I've gone from stage five to stage three, but more importantly, I feel great living a healthy lifestyle. And I'm so thankful and happy for it. Now tonight, we have one of our most engaging guests. Whenever we have him here, you guys love asking questions and listening to what he has to say. It is Dr. Rosansky, the author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. Now, if you are new to being diagnosed with kidney disease, or if you've been living with it and you have a lot of questions, this is the one book, the only book that I think everyone must have if they have kidney disease. It's very easy to understand, lots of great information, and it's not one of those doom and gloom books that just talks about getting ready for dialysis. Dr. Rosansky talks about what you can do to delay or maybe even not need dialysis, also how to better understand your labs and what they mean, and is your GFR really serious at that certain number based on your age? All that and more is in that book. Now let's get to talking to him live here. Everybody welcome Dr. Rosansky. Hey doctor, how you doing? I'm doing good, James. How are you doing? Hey, right, doing great. Here, I'll fix that on this okay. end. Oh, okay. I can. All right. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> all right, all right, here I am. Hello, hello. Uh, you want me to introduce myself? Yeah, um, yeah, for those? those that are new and don't know you, okay. tell them a yeah, bit so about yourself. So I am a retired kidney doctor. I still work with kidney patients in the free clinic. I'm still writing uh, some uh, academic articles and I've got another book I'm trying to write for patients with diabetes. Um, I've done a lot of clinical research, drug studies in my career, taking care of kidney patients, many, many kidney patients as head of the uh, kidney program in the VA Columbia, South Carolina. I started the kidney program in the dialysis program. And so I went to medical school in 68 to 72. So I've got many, many, many years of clinical experience. And I'm really happy that James has given me the opportunity to talk to you folks and get the word out because there's lots and lots of misunderstandings about kidney disease, lots of unnecessary fear. And tonight we're going to talk to you about how you can actually live longer with kidney disease. Oh and yeah, basing, something great. And I'm, and I'm basing my excitement on two articles that came out in the top kidney journal. So this is not just, you know, wishful thinking. This is uh, real data right off the press just came out this year. Yeah, and, now, before um, you jump into that doc, Judy yeah, yeah. is asking, how can she get a copy of your book? And we've well, got the link right there next to you. Go.dadvicetv.com slash book will take you to Amazon, or you can go to Amazon and search for learn the facts about kidney disease. Now, if you use that link, let me bring myself up here real quick. If you use that link, it will make certain you get the latest revision of the book. Um, there is two versions of it now, and you just recently revised it. So I encourage anyone looking to get the book, use that link. I bring it back up here on the screen go.dadvicetv.com slash book. It's also in the description below the video, and that will take you to the latest version of Dr. Rowe's amazing book. All right, now let's jump into how can I live longer? Okay, well, before we uh, get into specifics, let me review a couple of things that are well worth reviewing. 
First of all, one of the reasons to know your kidney number and whether you theoretically have kidney disease is because of the higher risk of getting hardening of the arteries, also called atherosclerosis, if you've got kidney disease. It's another risk factor. And so the question is, at what point, at what level of kidney number are you at risk of, of having uh, a death from atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease compared to someone without kidney disease? And one of the things that we've talked about, which is worth reiterating, is that let's say if you're over 65 and you do not have uh, any other comorbidity like diabetes or high blood pressure, or, and you don't have protein in the urine, if your kidney number is above 45, you may not be at a greater risk of, of dying from a kidney problem than somebody without uh, a, a kidney number that low. If you are, let's say, less than 60, uh, if you are uh, less than 65, and over 45, probably uh, any, anything below 60 would be putting you at higher risk. And if you're under 45, anything below 75 in your kidney number would put you at a higher risk. So for lots of folks, their kidney number uh, may not be necessarily a huge issue depending upon your age. First thing I wanted to review. Now, there are three general things that can affect your longevity, how long are you gonna to live? Today, we're gonna to talk about the lifestyle issues, and that's what these two studies are about. And uh, I'm, the next uh, Dad Advice TV that I'm on, I think I'm gonna get into uh, medications that might uh, give you some uh, increase in your lifespan. Um, and so your kidney number is a risk factor. Also, the protein in your urine is a risk factor. They are both risk factors to getting hardening of the arteries, atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease. And as you know, we've discussed this before, your kidney function declines with age. And that's why the abnorm abnormal number for your kidney number, your EGFR, when you get to be 65 to 70, you're looking at less than 45 for sure. That's when we would consider it abnormal. Now, <clears throat> here's something really interesting. The first study that I'm gonna to briefly touch on looked at 2.8 million folk. And they looked at <clears throat> what um, lifestyle issues related to your risk of getting kidney disease in the first place. And all the lifestyle issues that you may want to take on are going to presumably help you folks who already have kidney disease. But the lifestyle issues that we're going to discuss can also, if you take them on for your family and people that are around you that are not having an abnormal kidney number or protein in the urine, you can have them live longer. So these lifestyle issues are a campaign that you need to take on for yourself and your entire family and your friends too, for that matter. Um, the major things in the pre having kidney disease study, the 2.8 million folks, which is interesting, increased potassium in your diet, which is unusual for kidney patients to think about wanting to increase potassium, but that seemed to have a benefit to, to preventing kidney disease. And it probably relates to the fact that that correlates to having a plant-based diet, more fruits and vegetables. Mm. And, and without a doubt, exercise, and we're going to discuss that in detail, exercise. Exercise is one of the things, including your diet and your potassium intake, that can prevent other folks in your orbit from getting kidney disease. And the one thing that will go the opposite direction, which we're going to discuss in detail, is cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking will contribute to getting kidney disease. So these are lifestyle issues. And of course, you, you folks know that controlling blood pressure is important. We're not going to talk about that tonight. That clearly will have an effect on your kidney function, keeping your blood pressure in good range, controlling your diabetes, 
um, and controlling your cholesterol. All of those things can also have, have a benefit. But today we're going to focus on lifestyle. And like I said, in my next talk, I may talk about medications uh, and how they can uh, help you live longer. Sounds so, good. Now, before we jump into that, Doc, when you lean back, your mic is a little low. Oh, Could you turn oh. it up in your computer? That way we can hear you while you're sitting back. Because okay, this is going to okay. be great information for everyone. Okay, let's see here. Uh, hang on. Uh, where is it? Uh, yeah. Oh, Yvonne's an ex-smoker. Congrats on quitting smoking, Yvonne. That can be extremely challenging, especially if you've been doing it for a long time. Okay, okay. Sorry about this, folks. Um, That's okay. So James, I'm going into my sounds. Where the heck is yep. sounds? You had me doing this. Oh, here we go. Here's sounds. And let me... Both of these are at the maximum, James. Hang on a second. Wrong one. Oh, no. Here is... I got I got you covered now. How about now? Yes. Now I can adjust it on this end. Okay. 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 Sorry. Now you can go Again. ahead and lean back, and everyone should be able okay. to hear you great. Yeah. I, I don't want to lose anybody, and I hate to just... I, well, one thing that really bothers me, and it, and it happens so often, is somebody may have a lot to say, and if you can't hear them, it's a waste of everybody's time. Thank you for letting me know that you, I couldn't be heard. I don't want to waste time talking if people can't hear me. Please. Well, they can always turn the volume up and hear you, but then when I yeah. talk, it's booming. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, okay. So, um, so um, now, now we're going to talk about people that have kidney disease, and and what about your life expectancy? And um, first thing is, we already talked about this several times. Don't go by one kidney number to decide if you got a kidney problem. It's got to be at least two abnormal numbers at least three months apart. Same goes for your urine protein. It's got to be at least two checks of your urine three months apart to convince your doctor that you've got a problem. And so that's the first thing. And also remember, it's worth pointing out that those of you, the majority of you folks are stage three, so-called stage three, 30 to 60 EGFR, and remember, it's extremely rare that those folks in your category are going to wind up on dialysis. It's going to be something like two to four out of a hundred that it will. So what's more important than, and, and we've talked about things to, to prevent that progression, but what's more important for the average person that has CKD, especially stage three, is um, your atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. And... Um, and so what are the things that affect this risk? Um, so basically, if you have, at, we, I'll re repeat this again, the risk of getting atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which includes heart attacks, strokes, something called a TIA, which is called transient ischemic attack. What that means is you got a temporary decreased blood flow to the brain. It could give you speech problems. It could give you mobility problems that go away. And then it could lead to a stroke. It also it could also be needing stents or bypass surgery, or you may have pains in your legs when you walk. See, these are all part of this atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and it could also lead to heart failure. So that's what you're trying to prevent and to, by lifestyle changes that we're going to discuss today. And the risk of these problems goes up as your kidney function goes down. Now keep that in mind. The lower your kidney function, the higher your risk of getting these problems. The higher the protein in the urine, the higher your risk of getting these problems. Okay, so um, this particular study had 27,000 patients and they divided them up into EGFR over 60, 45 to 60, and under 45. And they looked at healthy behaviors and they looked at how they affected the risk of these bad outcomes. They looked at smoking versus not smoking. 
They looked at moderate to vigorous exercise, which I'm going to define in a few minutes versus no exercise. And um, here's the biggest takeaway for all groups of patients, regardless of your EGFR number, the number of lifestyle things that you take on and you take them on as your religion, you take it on seriously, you dedicate yourself to that. The more of these you take on, the lower your risk, no matter what your kidney function number is. So that is very good news. If you mm -hmm. can take these lifestyle changes on, you can have a benefit for yourself, and as we'll discuss in a few minutes, for your family and for your kids. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. So this goes across every level of kidney function. And um, here's, I think, the most exciting piece of information. I just talked to James about this. Those of you who already have, let's say, stage four mm -hmm. or even stage five, those, as I said, the lower your kidney function, the higher your risk. But guess what? If you take on these lifestyle changes, the greater your benefit because you got a higher risk and you're going to have a higher benefit if you take these lifestyle changes on. So take them very seriously. I think they are, and I don't just think, I know in many cases they are more important than the many, many, many different drugs that are often being pushed on you folks out there. So, um, on average, uh, if you are one of the folks that can get into moderate exercise, you could de decrease your risk of heart attacks and heart failure almost to half of those people who are exercising. Very impressive effects. So, what do we mean by a moderate uh, to, to strenuous, to vigorous exercise? We mean doing at least 30 minutes five times a week. And you don't have to start right away with that, but we're talking about roughly 30 minutes, five times a week or 150 minutes a week. Now, what does exercise do? It helps your blood pressure. It helps your glucose control. It helps your cholesterol control. It'll keep you from getting fatter. It can help you control your weight. It'll help your breathing capacity. It'll decrease your stress. So before I go into the benefits, which are really amazing, and you need to pay attention to them, let's talk about how to get exercise. So many of us are spending time, like we are right now, sitting in front of mm -hmm. a screen. Sitting in front of a screen. We, it's a TV screen. It's an iPad. It's a computer. One thing to think about is just make a deal with yourself. You're going to knock off 30 minutes of screen time and get out and do something physical, okay? You and start out slow. Walking, gardening, playing with the dogs, dancing, swimming, anything that's not sitting that gets you up and active. Right on. You're absolutely right, James. You're absolutely right. Now, if you can't walk, stationary bikes are wonderful. And there's all kinds of stationary bikes that you can pick up from very cheap to very fancy. If you have, and, and if you have trouble with arthritis and so forth, as James mentioned, getting in a pool and doing water aerobics is just as good as doing aerobics in the gym and, and jumping up and down on the floor. Works really well. People I just went have, to grab one of the things I use because I sit all day long. My job is sitting with COVID. So I bought one of these, oh my goodness, it's so heavy. <laughs> one of these under desk ellipticals wow i'm impressed i'm impressed boy that's cool very cool well well yeah, my, the only problem is i need locking wheels on my chair <laughs> <laughs> i had to take the, the floor mat out from under my chair otherwise when i'm pedaling i go get further, further away from it well that's got to be a sight whenever i'm sitting around it's got a handle I can carry it to the living room if I'm going to sit down and watch Netflix or something. I can put it right there, and I can just go. And this one has a little remote to adjust the, 
the um, resistance. It's a, it's a magnetic. So it's super easy. And then I try to get out 30 minutes a day just to get out of the room and get out of the house and walk around and do things. Very cool, James. I had never seen that. So those of you who have not gotten into exercise, you might want to start slow. Start with 15 minutes a day if that's all you're ready to do. And slowly work yourself up to 30 minutes a day, five times a week. Any exercise, any, I mean any, will be a benefit. Getting off your butt and just walking around your house, walking around the mall, any exercise will have a benefit. So don't give up if you can't be a marathon runner. Um, the more exercise, the better. It's like dose response. The higher the dose of your exercise, the more the benefit. And you want to do exercises if you have the opportunity that exercise your muscle groups. If you can build muscle, you can counteract the inevitable loss of muscle as we get older. And as if you are one of the folks who has progressive of kidney disease, you will also lose muscle. So try to do exercises with the various muscle groups if you have the opportunity to have a home gym or go to a gym. And I think I just went back to the gym, by the way, since I got my two doses of vaccine. Awesome. I, hadn't, I hadn't been there for a year. I, I missed it terribly, but I used, I do all my ex, all my muscle groups, I do my aerobics, and I also combine it with a little bicycle riding. I, I got to get my exercise in or I just don't feel right. So what do we mean by moderate to strenuous? It means walking at a brisk pace where you get slightly short of breath, but you can still talk to your partner and try to get a partner to exercise with. It'll make the time go. It'll make it much more fun. Um, and uh, my thinking is for a lot of folks, whether it's diabetes or high blood pressure, uh, I think that you should try non-pharmacologic, non-drug approach to these problems if they're not severe. And exercise will, will have a remarkable benefit on both of these common what we call comorbidities, diabetes, and high blood pressure. So let me tick off some of these. It's almost like miraculous. What, what does exercise do? Exercise actually can decrease inflammation. Now, most folks know inflammation. It's part of lots of illnesses. There's lots of inflammatory mediators and so forth. And it also revs up your immune system so you can fight off infections better. Um, and because it decreases inflammation, there's a relationship between exercise and decreased diabetes. But not only that, decreased cancer incidence, supposedly related to decreasing inflammation. Exercise slows aging. It is the fountain of life. It will help you live longer. It will actually trigger growth of new brain cells. You Ooh, like that. I like that one. New brain cells. It's an antidepressant. It'll turn on your serotonin. It's like these antidepressant drugs, but you don't want to take drugs if you can avoid them. It just do exercise and it can have all of these benefits that we take pharmaceuticals for. And it will you, de I, I okay. absolutely love the anti aging part because. My bathroom, my wife has her own bathroom. I have my own. People who see my bathroom swear it's my wife from all the anti-aging creams <laughs> and retina this and this and this wrinkle tightening. <laughs> I try my hardest to hide all the wrinkles and the gray hairs. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm, I'm trying to age gracefully. I don't know. What can I say? But it will de it'll de you exercise regularly. And we're talking about, you know, doing moderate to strenuous. Like I said, walk it to the point where you get a little shorter breath, but you can still talk. It'll decrease your risk of dementia, which is something that I worry about since both my folks, ha uh, my dad passed away with it and my mom has it. Um, 
and uh, it increases the volume of your brain. You get a bigger brain, you get more brain tissue if you exercise. There is no lower threshold. Just again, just because you can't do a marathon or you can't do the 30 minutes, uh, you know, five times a week. There, you get out, instead of using your car, try to walk to the grocery store if you can. If you can climb stairs, try to climb the stairs. Whenever you have something that you can do to get off your butt and exercise, go up to the mailbox. Go check it three times a day just to get a little bit of exercise. It's all benefit. There's no and, lower limit. And all those little bits add up. If you can't get the 30 minutes all at once, do 10 minutes now, five minutes later, just throughout the day, like Dr. Rowe was saying, find moments that you can get up, you can move, all of that adds up and counts. And any of you who like devices, get yourself a Fitbit. I mean, you know, if you, you if you're Fitbit- Or an Apple uh, Watch, I'm an Apple guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, j just get one of those things and that'll tell you if you've done the magical 10 steps, um, uh, the magical 10 steps, 10,000 steps a day. It'll tell, and you, you may be surprised if you're just walking around the house, taking care of kids, going out and doing yard work, that you are, mm -hmm. you are getting more exercise uh, than you may think you're getting. Yeah, so like the, the greater Gilby down here just commented that that's their exercises, housework, gardening, shopping, walking around, and all that adds up and counts. More benefits. If you exercise regularly, and I know I like to eat, and, and my wife tells me I'd be as big as a house if I didn't exercise. But, you know, exercise will help you maintain your weight, and it can help you lose weight. It will put you in a better mood. It will give you more energy. It'll help you sleep better. It'll give you better sex life. Okay? There we go. Better sex life. I mean, you know, we're still going. Better memory. Better brain function. Decrease your blood pressure. Decreases your anxiety. Decreases your depression. All of these things have been demonstrated. I mean, the one thing, James, is I'm a skeptic, and you know that from reading my book and hearing some of our, you know, Dad Vice mm -hmm. TV talks. Exercise is a, you know, is scientifically been demonstrated to do these things, and it's amazing. Okay, I'm not done. It will increase the strength in your body to keep you as we get older to keep you independent as you age. Mm -hmm. If you still exercise as you get into your 70s, 80s, and 90s, it could keep you independent and even more importantly, keep you from having bad balance and help you from having fall injuries. The commonest, one of the commonest reasons old folks die is they have an accident, they wind up in the hospital and they die like that. So especially as you get older, try to walk, try to dance, try to uh, play soccer with the kids, do your gardening, anything. They will all have a benefit and no lower limit. And remember, taking on these lifestyle changes, the lower your kidney function, the more benefit that it will have for you. But for every one of you, whether you've got high, medium, or low kidney number, everybody will get a benefit with these lifestyle changes. Now, before, uh, if you want to mention some more about exercise before I go into uh, smoking, which I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time on, because that is a big lifestyle issue. Yeah, and um, Beverly had a great suggestion, which I did today. I actually, um, I was telling Dr. Rowe earlier, I looked online, something I wanted to buy. I didn't want to wait two days for it to come from Amazon. Target's website said they had it. So I went there and I parked as far away for two reasons. I parked as far away as I can. One, like Beverly mentioned here, it gives you a lot of extra steps. Number two, my car has Dad Vice TV real big all over it, and I wanted to park it out there like a billboard for everyone driving by to see. So I always park real far away over by the road. But that's a great suggestion. Park a little bit further 
And you don't have to park all the way at the furthest spot. You can just park a little bit further than you normally would. And those little extra steps add up. And then Cheryl mentioned the Apple Watch has the time to stand. You can disable that. That's something I definitely keep turned on on mine. If I'm sitting still and it's approaching an hour of me sitting on my butt, it bugs me to stand. It says, hey, it's time to stand. You gotta do it within the next 10 minutes. Get up and move. And I'll get up, I'll walk around the house, I'll check on the kids, I'll go find the dogs and pet them and come back and sit down and continue working. So it's a great way to, to you know, remind you that, you know, a lot of time has passed. Because I could sit here working and three or four hours could go by and I would not even notice it. When I get really into a project and I've got a deadline, I'm like, oh, I want to get this done really quick. You know, I've got to get this done in two weeks. I want to work on it really hard. It's great having that right there. Um, James, I just, I, somebody, I, maybe this has already been resolved. They said they didn't see the link to the book. I actually looked for it myself because of the, just give you a little background. So that's the link, go to datavicetv.com. But after the shows are over, every one of, of uh, James' shows, Data Vice TV shows, you can get on YouTube and find them. And, I, and that link does show up, right, James, for every show? Yeah. It'll, it'll, so you don't, so even if you're not getting it live, when the show is over, you can click on it because it'll be right next to the um, Yep, it's there on the screen when show. you're on there. That way it's easy if people are like, hey, you know what? I like this guy. I want to get that book. Um, it's right there on the screen. It's also always in the description below. And a few people had some questions about it. Um, someone said, what's the title of the new one? It's not a new book per se. It's a new edition. It's updated with more information. When was this first one published? Was it March? First, first one is in March, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. the new one or the updated version was in November, if I remember correctly. Right, yeah. Yep. You, got go. you got it, you got it. Yeah, so look for the November edition. And, I've been exercised, uh, my memory's getting better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely some things in the new one that you wanna have. Okay, so let's go on to the next big topic of the evening, and that is smoking. Smoking is the number one issue that if we could get rid of it, it's the number one cause of preventable deaths. Mm. Uh, one out of three deaths from heart disease uh, can be attributed to smoking or secondhand smoke. Any one of you who smokes has to be aware that even if your kids, your friends, your family, whoever you care about, whoever is around you, they are getting the same bad effects of smoking due to the secondhand smoke that you get and they get all of the bad outcomes. So you need to not only get rid of the smoking for yourself, but do it for everyone else around you. There's no safe amount of cigarette smoking. And, and clearly the more you smoke, the bigger the risk. The good news is if you can stop smoking, your atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, like we talked about, the risk of heart attacks, the risk of strokes, the risk of so-called TIAs, the risk of lung cancer, all of these things, if you stop smoking, they will get better or go away. Also, if you stop smoking, you can slow the rate of decline of your kidney function. You can literally add years to your life. Your lungs will function better. You will cough less. You will be less short of breath. You'll have more energy. You'll actually have less stress. You have better fertility. You have a better sex drive. Your sense of smell and taste will improve. Your skin will get younger, James. Your oh. teeth will get whiter. <laughs> so, I love both of those, but I've never ever smoked. Mainly because I'm, I'm, I'm too tight with money to ever spend money on cigarettes. It's like, you're just burning the money. So, I, I've never done that. So I don't have to worry about my teeth or, or the wrinkles or anything. But it's good for those that are out there. <laughs> and your breath will be sweeter. 
Oh, but, oh. Again, but again, a smoke-free home will decrease the chances that your children are going to have asthma and are going to get the same heart and lung problems that you could get from secondhand smoke. And in the U.S., uh, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, and I'm sure for every country around the globe, the same similar kinds of cancer, heart, uh, lung associations, they have all kinds of resources to help you stop smoking. And there's lots and lots of ways to get yourself off the cigarettes. By it's, Nicotine is a drug. Nicotine is in cigarettes. It is a tough drug to get off of. People have withdrawal trying to get off nicotine. And so you have lots of nicotine sources in a patch, in gum, and in lozenges. And you should work with somebody who is interested as a medical professional to help you stop smoking. They can give you a good idea of how much nicotine you should take in the form of one of these patches of gum or lozenges, depending upon how many cigarettes you are smoking, so you don't go cold turkey. And then you will basically be tapering off your nicotine, no cigarettes, get off the nicotine addiction, you taper off the nicotine. There are also some drugs that are prescribed, some of them people have uh, side effects from, but there's lots of ways to, uh, to do this. Now, before I, um, uh, well, let me just dis discuss briefly uh, other lifestyle issues. Mm -hmm. If you could figure out ways, now exercise is a great way really to relax and relieve stress, but if you can figure out other ways to relax, whether you try meditation, whether you try Tai Chi, uh, whether you just want to listen to some classical music or whatever can relax your brain. One of the main things that I see with people around me is they're so engaged in their little devices, their iPads, their, their phones, their, you know, their pocket computers. <laughs> Get yourself away from those things. Get yourself away from the bright lights of the screens. Put yourself in a darker room, quiet music, learn meditation if you have the inclination, learn Tai Chi. Uh, you want to decrease your stress. That will clearly have a benefit in longevity. Stress kills, you know that. Stress raises the blood pressure. Stress will do all the opposite bad things uh, that, uh, that exercise do. Stress will raise the bad chemicals in your body and can really uh, wreak havoc on your body. You and want it really puts a lot of stress on your heart, and a lot of people don't realize you don't really die of kidney disease. You die of heart issues, which your kidney disease helped make happen. Um, so stress right there, bad on your body, bad on your heart, good to take care of. And and, and I'm I'm not you know unrealistic. I know everybody has stresses we got to deal with. But you've got to be smart about it. You've got to give yourself downtime. You've got to give yourself quiet time. You've got to give yourself time away from those screens, away from the news, which is always bad and upsetting in our tribal culture. Get away from that stuff. Take a break. And of course, if you could take a break and exercise, that would be the best break you could take. Now, try to get eight hours of sleep. Uh, and that plus relaxation will clearly decrease your blood pressure and your risk of the hardening of the arteries, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease issues we've been talking about. Now, I'll briefly touch on something that many of you may have. You may have something called sleep apnea. If you sleep with someone and they notice that you have periods where you stop breathing, and this is especially common with people that are overweight, Sleep apnea is a risk factor by itself for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease problems. And it can have a increased uh, propensity to make you diabetic, raise your blood pressure. You may fall asleep during the day. You may be tired during the day. 
And it can get better with weight loss, but if you are someone who's been noticed to have periods where you stop breathing during sleep, go to a lung doctor, get your internist to get you to a lung doctor, a pulmonary doctor. They can do a sleep study, they can diagnose sleep apnea, and there are machines that you can use to help treat the sleep apnea and, to, and this way overcome some of the problems that come with sleep apnea. You'll get better sleep and you'll decrease the risks that come with sleep apnea. So let's now move to something that's extremely popular. Everybody, especially young people, every young person that I know in my orbit, and I have a lot of them, uh, doing the e-cigarettes and oh. the vaping. So let's let's get down and really dig into this because you need to understand it because it's extremely prevalent. I'm sure most of you have kids uh, around you that are doing the e-cigarettes. And a lot of kids never go and buy a pack of cigarettes. They go right to the e-cigarettes. They are harmful and they're not without use. They're they are, it's relative, they are better than smoking a pack of cigarettes. But there are potential harms in the e-cigarettes that can make them more dangerous. And the reason for that is you're breathing in stuff in this liquid and there's ultrafine particles of junk in these e-cigarette mixtures that can cause real harm. Um, so what's happening in an e-cigarette? You got lots of nicotine. And if, and if anybody smoking e-cigarettes, either that be you or anyone you know, your kids, make sure that there's nothing in that liquid that they're smoking other than the nicotine. You want to stay away from the flavors and because they can have t poisonous chemicals in these e-cigarettes that you're breathing in every time you puff it. There's a lot of black market dangerous stuff that are being put into these e-cigarette liquids. Now, there's lots of nicotine. So just because kids say, oh, mommy, daddy, I'm not smoking cigarettes. I'm just smoking these little vape things. They get addicted to nicotine, just like you two or three pack a day folks are going to get addicted to nicotine. So you want to try to head it off. You might try to convince them to get off their e-cigarettes if you can. They can also lead to the complications of you know, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And it's hard to kick the habit just like it is kicking the cigarette habit. Kids these days, the rate of e-cigarette smoking has gone up 10 times what it was just a few years back. It's like 40% of young kids never smoke a cigarette but they get hooked on these e-cigarettes. And you need to be aware that they can be real harmful and they have killed people. I mean, the, the chemicals in it, the black market stuff, you know, people have died from vaping. But the biggest thing to remember is it can also, it is better than cigarettes. If, mm -hmm. if somebody is trying to get off smoking cigarettes, I'm okay with you trying to vape and vape less and then maybe go to uh, a nicotine lodges, or not lod lozenges, or or nicotine gum, you know, to try to use it as taper. a step to wean yeah. off a of, of the the of nicotine the, of the nicotine of the nicotine yeah. addiction. Exactly, exactly. Don't find I it think, as a replacement for cigarettes. Just a step away. And and it's just a cool thing. I mean, young kids are doing it because everybody's doing it. You know, hey, this look, it's just like in the 50s. We used to watch TV in the 50s and 60s. Every program, everybody was smoking cigarettes because you are cool if you didn't have a cigarette. In, in today's world, it's the e-cigarettes. Young kids don't feel they're cool without the e-cigarettes, and you need to try to convince them about their harms. I'll just touch on a few other sources of uh, nicotine. Uh, I don't know that this is real common. Some parts of the country it is chewing tobacco uh, and snuff. Uh, both I'm of in these, Ohio. It's popular here. Well, both of these have lots of nicotine. They have probably four times as much nicotine in them as do uh, cigarettes, an average cigarette. These things can give you 
cancer of the mouth, cancer of the windpipe, and uh, you may start getting white patches on your tongue and on your windpipe in the back of your mouth, and this can lead to some serious cancers. So they are not without risk, and they are all addicting. It's the same deal. You can get addicted to nicotine and chew just like you can with e-cigarettes or with regular cigarettes. Um, I don't know. It's probably unusual, but some kids like to smoke water pipes. And I'm going to tell you a water pipe story in a minute. The water pipes uh, have more toxic stuff in them in the mix. They put various types of tobacco and various types of liquids in it. And you could be sitting there for an hour puffing on whatever these toxic substances are, and they can also give you cancer, but they can cause infection. And James, I was in Turkey, and uh-huh. um, and Those are they have there, I'm guessing. they have these they have these hookah bars. You yeah, guys yeah, have yeah. Hookah, H O O K A H, and and I figured, yeah, what the heck? We got some time off. I'm going to go to a hookah bar. And so they set us up, and I don't, you know, do 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 that. I just do it as a tourist. But sure enough, I came down with a bad viral infection. I mean, you oh. know, it, and, and and especially with COVID, I don't think any place is doing hookah bars because anyway, in addition to the nicotine effects and the cancer effects, uh, these water pipes uh, that you're sharing can can uh, give you viruses, and they could be dangerous from that standpoint as well so we got a little time to answer anybody's questions we do have questions about cigars apparently without inhaling i don't know how you do that i'm not a smoker um but our cigars count as cigarettes right yeah yeah Here, the thing is you're probably not getting quite as much damage to your lungs if you don't inhale them but the stuff that's that's coming in in your it's, it, because secondhand smoke can make people very sick, can increase their risk of heart disease, increase their risk of asthma and cancer. So it's it's breathing the things that are puffed in and out of a cigar, just breathing them in, and not taking them in as deeply may not have quite the same risk but they all have the risk of giving you atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and cancer. Now, uh, pipes uh, will also have the risk and most people don't inhale the pipe, but you start getting into higher risk of tongue, mouth, uh, and throat cancers with, um, with pipes and cigars than you do with cigarettes. But lower risk card- from the cardiovascular standpoint And I don't think there are many people that are chain smoking pipe smokers. So in general, I would guess that it's less of a risk factor, but it still is a risk factor. Same goes for cigars. I don't think people smoke dozens of cigars a day. Generally, people I know will smoke maybe one or two a day. Let's see, I'm gonna look at what other questions we may have in here. Someone did, now this is related to smoking and also a bit to eating. Um, I don't know if you had an opinion on this. Um, the Greater Bilby posted, CBD oil is the latest fad. And I'll tell you, I see the signs everywhere on the gas stations and so many ads online about it. Do you have an opinion on CBD oil? I do not, although Listen, anything that is theoretically a pharmacologic drug can have a placebo effect. I'm not going to tell you that CBD is only placebo, but I think just like oils and and things that you smell, candles, um, as long as you're not breathing in toxic substances and they relax you, I'm good with that. Anything that can relax folks. Uh, I'm good with. Um, James, I want to address something which is a little off top. Jane and Bill Gandy were talking about getting my book in Canada, and they're saying, uh, understand the expert that are difficult to get from their own doctors. Now, I, I think that any of you who watch James' program,
buy a book like my book. You are in a class which I think are uh, special people because you're taking charge of your health. You're not going to the doctor and going, oh, yes, doctor, whatever you say. Oh, you want me to go on dialysis with my kidney number? That's EGFR 15 or 20? Exactly. Please take charge of your kidney problem. And you'd be surprised at the, um, I don't want to call it lack of knowledge, but the sketchiness of knowledge and some of the things that I discuss on these programs, a lot of your doctors are just not aware of. And if you bring the information that you've learned from my book to your doctor, you will share in the decision making regarding managing any of your medical problems, including your kidney problem. The optimal way to get your medical care is to educate yourself and share in the discussions and the management. And if, you're, and if your doc is not willing to listen to you, your knowledge and, and points of view regarding what drug to take, you know, what's good, what's bad, you know, what diet to use, when you, you know, when is a kidney number really something to worry about or not worry about? You know, when is dialysis something that should be delayed versus rushed into? I mean, you've got my book and you'll get some really good, interesting things to discuss with your doctor. Take mm -hmm. charge. And if you got a doctor that's not willing to talk and, and is open to somebody who, <clears throat> and I reference everything in my book. My book is, is not junk. It's all referenced with uh, what they call... Um, uh, articles that have peer review it's not just like anecdotal garbage that that you will get for most of the things that you talk about get your kidneys healthy quick whether they be herbs or these you know uh, supplements so many di solutions. dietary supplements oh, none yeah. of these things are studied with what they call peer review randomized controlled trials closely looked at research. So anything that's in my book is, is well researched and you could, and if your doctor's not willing to listen to the, you know, the science and, or, or can give you other, I, I don't have all the information. Look, I'm always ready to learn and you should be too, but your doctor should be too. And if, if he or she is not time to get a new one. In my exactly. Opinion. Give them the boot and <laughs> doctors that I've, so I've had a few, that I've ran across that just they just don't want to hear anything. It's this way, that's the way it is. But those are very, very few. The majority, the a huge amount, nearly every doctor that I've ran into, they love it when they find out that I'm engaged, that I want to know why, so that I know why it's important to do that. So I listen and I follow the instructions. If I don't know the why, yeah, it may not be important. I may not do what they say, but the more we learn, the more we become our own advocate for our own health, our own care. And I find doctors really like that, the majority of them, because then they know, you know what? If I share stuff with this person, they're going to listen. I got, and if, I they're, got. if they're doing research, you know, this person, once they get to know you, they'll know, hey, he knows the, what do you call it? The hoo-hoo, the woo-woo? The woo-woo, the, the woo-woo, woo -woo. the nonsense. Somebody's yeah, talking know. about. They'll know he can detect <laughs> woo-woo. And so whatever he's asking about must be kind of have some legitimacy and you know, have a conversation. <laughs> you know, James, I have not spent a lot of time looking at these comments. Some of these are great. I'm going to have to comment on the comments. Yeah, go ahead. First, oh, yeah, let me start with one. Sex is also great exercise. I try and get at least an hour per day. My poor wife, though. Whoa! Yay! I love it. Okay, now now something much more serious. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I was Anna says I was told no exercise it increases creatinine. No. Again, please go to my dad advice. Talk about creatinine. That is nonsense. Nonsense. And 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 if. You ran a marathon and you destroyed muscle and your creatinine went up because of muscle destruction. It has nothing to do with your kidneys 
And creatinine exactly. is not harmful to the kidneys. Creatinine is just a marker that we're able to use to measure your kidney function. So and, don't And that's probably one of the that. biggest myths is, <laughs> and, and it looks like even I fell into that, that belief when I first was diagnosed that creatinine is bad. I got to get creatinine down. It's not bad. It's just the marker they use to estimate kidney function. It's that protein leakage. It's how's your, how's your health doing? Your blood pressure. Are you taking care of your heart and everything? It's all of that together that matters, not this one number. And focusing on reducing it is not the right thing to focus on. And just another word uh, as an aside, those people that have more creatinine, higher creatinine, uh, if you got the same uh, person and they both weigh 200 pounds and one has more muscle mass, that person's going to have a higher creatinine than the 200 pound person that has little muscle mass. And guess who's going to be healthier? and live longer. The one who's got the greater, better nutrition and the more muscle mass. So no, you can exercise and that's definitely not a reason uh, yep. not hey, to. Here's a, anyway. here's a recent one go, I'd go love ahead. for you to, to, to comment on from Jim Maddox. He says is he, he he's newly diagnosed. His, he, his GFR is African-American, is 55, is non-African-American, is 46. Um, it looks like from his thumbnail, if that's him, he's a white male. So his GFR is 46 and he, it looks like he may say he's 64 years old. Yeah. Okay. I believe that's what All he's right. saying. He's a 64 right. year old male. So okay. a 64 year old male with a GFR of 46 is what it looks like. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, you've got something that needs to be followed. You need to know just not just what your kidney number is today. You need to know what your kidney number is averaging over the next year. If you go to your doctor every three or four months, you get the number three times this year, maybe three times next year, and see what the trend of that number is. And more importantly, make sure you find out if you got protein in the urine, because that's going to be a much greater predictor of whether your kidney function may decline. If you got lots of protein in the urine, it tends to be a indicator that you may uh, get decline in kidney function. Now, someone's talking about kidney size. Kidney size, as your kidney function declines, as it gets really low, kidney size generally gets smaller. The exception to that is polycystic kidney disease. And one way we use is kidney docs to know if your kidney problem is so-called acute you took a drug, something happened, you got dehydrated, and that's why your kidney number dropped down to 20 EGFR or whatever. We look at your kidney size. If your kidney size is normal, that would indicate it's uh, a recent insult to your kidneys. All right, I got another one here for you, doctor. This is one that just breaks my heart. Okay, Avery says, my dad just found out he's stage four. And has to go on dialysis. He started having really bad itching. Is that related to a CKD? Okay, James, good question. So stage four is by far not, not dialysis. Stage five, and look up my talk on stage five, is also not even necessary dialysis, not necessarily dialysis. Stage four is definitely not dialysis. Some people with stage four number between 15 and 30, roughly ballpark number, they may start having anemia. They may need to go on certain medicines. They may need to watch their potassium, some things like that, but no, no, no dialysis. Even stage five, which is 15 or less, if you're 10 to 15, you are still early. Look at my book, Look at our talk about when to start dialysis. You, the best time, if everything else works out for someone, is to start dialysis around five or six. But that's not for everybody. And you got to go with your doctor's advice and your trend of kidney function decline and your symptoms and so forth. But that is sure not dialysis. And 
there are far too many incentives for dialysis mm -hmm. companies and people that are in the dialysis field to put people on dialysis who don't need it. And one of the main reasons I wrote my book is to save people from unnecessarily going on dialysis, which is a miserable life if you don't need to be on it. If it's going to save your life, by all means, you should be on it. Now, or, since you mentioned her dad has some itching, I'm going to guess it could possibly be high phosphorus. If, you, if your diet is high in phosphorus, especially with lower kidney function, the phosphorus kind of pulls calcium from your bones and it can put deposits along the skin, which can cause itching or a white hazing. I've also yes. seen allergies where people have an allergic reaction to something. I would say 90% no related to your kidneys. Nine, that's my opinion, personal opinion. And which, what James is describing, which will be another talk, is a so-called CKD bone disease, which relates to calcium and phosphorus and parathyroid hormone. James, the itching deal, I've only seen people itch from kidney problems when they get extremely low in their number and they have uncontrolled uh, parathyroid problems in calcium phosphorus. So my itching is a common symptom that people have without any kidney problems. So I, my guess is not related. And you yeah. certainly don't want to start dialysis because you itch and your GFR is, is like 20, <laughs> you know, absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. The important thing there is stage four is not dialysis. And I can't think of any time when stage four would be dialysis. If, if you have, first of all, <clears throat> if you have changed in kidney function and your kidney number is 20, but it's going down to zero, you may need to start dialysis. You can't read your kidney number when you've got a moving target, when your kidney function is declining. You've got to be stable and you can't be in a hospital with an acute illness or heart failure to evaluate your kidney number. And that's why we say get at least two numbers repeated over 90 days to know what an accurate reflection of your kidney number. Very good. Were there any more, or we're actually, <laughs> we're just past the top of the hour. Were there any more comments you wanted to, to uh, address? Well, I, I think uh, these, these, these are great. I, I, thank you for all of your comments, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I mean, yeah, I, I do talk about protein a lot in my book. You will learn all about the ins and outs of protein and what they Important. mean. There's a lot of discussion. You're gonna, I'll talk about the drugs that can affect the amount of protein in the urine. And I talk about diets and what their relationship is to protein in the urine. No, high protein diet doesn't cause more protein in the urine. And I get into great detail about low protein diets. Yeah, which could be dangerous for some people. So don't, Absolutely. don't Absolutely. just be going on a low protein diet yourself. Always, no matter what you do, work with your healthcare team, get their advice. It's like a football team and you've got your doctors, you know, they're different players on your football team and you need them to work together and help guide you on what the right plays are to kind of keep going and living a great life while you happen to have kidney disease. Sal, one last comment. Uh, you're doing a 24 hour urine. I would, I, I, I'm not a fan of 24 hour urines to find out protein in the urine. There's something called a spot urine. And it's in my book too. You take a tiny sample of your urine and they measure the urine protein and they measure the urine creatinine. That ratio gives you a very good estimate of how much protein you're spilling in 24 hours. And I would do that several times. That's the best way to get a handle. Just like you don't wanna uh, depend, uh, determine your kidney number on one value, you wanna get multiple values of kidney numbers, multiple values of urine protein, and a spot urine to protein creatinine ratio. I talk about it in my book, ask your doctor about it. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And Dr. Rowe, thank you. And guys, you can get his book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, by going to the link right there it is on the screen, go.dadvicetv.com slash book. 
It's also down below in the description. Dr. Rose here every other week with lots of great information. And I think the next one's going to be how to prolong your life with medications. Ooh. With, if you've got kidney disease, what yes. medicines really can make a difference? Perfect. All right, everybody. We'll see you in the next video. Bye, y'all.